Welcome everyone. This is Youth Gaming and Gambling. I am Tana Russell, Assistant Director with the Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling. We're very glad that you're here. And I will tell you some more about myself in just a moment, but I'm also joined today by our Executive Director, Maureen Greeley. Good morning, everybody. Excited to be here. This is the third day of our trainings with folks across the state and actually some other states besides Washington. Really excited to talk about this topic as youth gambling and gaming is so important. I have been involved in this field since 1998 and have been both on the gaming side as well as on the side of, of support and help services. I became involved with the council at that time in 98 and later became a consultant for them and then became director in, uh, the, gosh, I'm going into my 16th year now. And we are celebrating our 30th anniversary as a nonprofit organization providing services for prevention, treatment, awareness, and recovery support. So we're excited to be here. We work closely with HCA, particularly with the Problem Gambling Program through HCA and Roxanne Waldron, but are working with a lot of other departments, whether it's prevention or um, tobacco or cannabis. So, so excited to have all of you here. You have an incredible presenter in Tana. She's been with us for a couple of years, but her background is as a clinician in this area goes much farther back than that. So I will turn it over to her. Thank you all for attending and I hope you get a lot out of today's session. I will be manning the chat. So please don't hesitate to put questions and comments in the chat and we will try to address them throughout the session. Have a great training. Thank you much. As she said, my name is Tana Russell. My background is as an addictions counselor with specialties in tobacco treatment as well as gambling counseling. So that's the perspective I will be coming to you from today. ECPG is neither for nor against gambling or gaming. We understand that for many of the population, it is a recreational activity and can add positive elements to their life. We are, however, very much for help being available to anyone and everyone that may be impacted negatively by it. We did add gaming to our mission statement about six years ago. While the majority of our work is still more around problem gambling, our work on the gaming and gaming disorder front is growing exponentially. Uh, very, very quickly. So I'm sure there will be even more to come. I want to give you just a quick trigger warning by nature of this training topic. There will be slides that contain text, images, audio, video, other media depicting gambling elements and video games for educational purposes. If this is triggering, please mute, minimize, step away from your computer as needed, take care of yourself. And also just a quick disclaimer on age appropriate content. I understand this is mainly an adult presentation, but there may be some youth in the audience as well. I do have one video where there is a gamer streaming talking about his uh, salary. And in the chat on the side of the video are his fans commenting. There may be some colorful language coming in from his fans. I can't do anything about that. And I do have one slide talking about the ESRB's rating system for Grand Theft Auto 5. It's a text description, no video or images depicting why it's rated the way it is, but again, might be somewhat mature. Our agenda today is going to focus on one, two, and three here. The blurred lines of gambling and gaming, its overlap with substance use disorder, and some healthy play guidelines, risk, and protective factors to be aware of. I'm not going to be touching on number four much, but I have included a lot of prevention awareness programs and a whole host of resources and help services in the slide deck for you. And you can download the PDF of this entire slide deck and all of the links and resources we've provided for you on the event training page. First, I want to find out from you all why you're here and who's in the audience. 
So you should be seeing a poll question on your screen. And maybe all of these apply to you. I don't know. Are you a parent, work in school or with students, work in behavioral health or counseling services? Are you a prevention specialist? Or do you know someone, someone of any age who might have or had problems from gaming or gambling? Because I'm guessing that might have been a reason that this training piqued your interest. And we're very glad that you're here. So in just a moment, I will close the poll and we will share some results. So I'm going to close that in three, two, one. And we'll share results. And it looks like we have mostly clinicians in the house. Thank you, those of you after my own heart. And a little bit of everything else, which is fantastic. So we may have some of you here where this content can apply to you in a couple of different ways, both as a professional and as a parent. Actually, if you know a kid, this can be very useful to you. All right, so first let's just establish that some games really are just games. There's no gambling involved at all. This is most board games, card games, most video games. However, any game, can be turned into a gambling game if those playing it decide they want to start making wagers on something. What makes a game a gambling game uh, and regulated as such is if it meets these three criteria on the right, prize, chance, and consideration, meaning someone puts something of value, could be money, could be possessions, could be a great deal of their time up for consideration, and that is their investment for the chance to win the prize. They might miss out on the prize entirely and lose what they invested. They might get a prize that they feel is worth more than what they invested, or they might get a prize they feel is worth less than what they invested and not exactly what they were hoping for. There is a difference between a purchase and a gamble. So a purchase is what you do when you buy your groceries. There's a product, it's price marked, and you buy it for that price plus tax. The video game stores have the same operation. They have their product. It gives a price. The price may be in the game's virtual currency as opposed to dollar amounts. It might show the price in gems or jewels or coins or whatever, but they go to the store and they buy it for that amount. Where it starts to get into the gambling realm is when the product they're buying is unknown. The game is asking them to pay an amount for something, but the person doesn't exactly know yet what they're going to get out of that. That could be a loot box, which we'll talk more about, uh, battle bundles or passes or mystery discounts, anything like that where the final result is hidden from the buyer at the time of purchase. People may choose to play one game over another for a variety of reasons. It's what their friends are playing. They can interact with their friends online. And generally, the gaming world is played with their physical world friends. So it's like we can hang out in person. We can hang out in the game. It's all a social interaction with the same people in some cases. Uh, they may want to develop their skills on a certain game, or they've spent money on it and feel like they need to get their money's worth out of it. I am going to pick on Fortnite a bit throughout this presentation, not that I'm anti-Fortnite, they just make it very easy because most people know what Fortnite is, they've heard of that, and they've checked all the boxes, so they have all of the things I'm going to be talking about today. In this particular article, you can go read the whole thing if you want, an individual in the field of user experience or UX talks about why Fortnite was so successful when a new game comes out and learners are learning how to play it. All the rules, the mechanics, the missions, the features have to be explained to the player, filtered through their own attention spans, emotions, motivations, and retained so they remember what they were doing next time they log on and play. But our perception is subjective, our attention is scarce, and our memory is fallible. So game designers have to work around all of these things. And a good user experience means that the game has good usability, that's pretty self-explanatory, and good engageability, meaning it can appeal to a number of different people's variety of motivations to play the game. Some people want to shoot things and destroy stuff. Some people want to just 
uh, do something social with their friends. Others want to be creative and do things inside the game they can't do in real life. Some people want to increase on their ranking uh, or skill development for a league or whatever. There's different emotions people want to feel and the game flow is this. This is the progression of the game difficulty in relationship to the skill level of the player. So if the difficulty doesn't progress fast enough, then the game feels too easy. It gets boring. On the other side, if the game difficulty progresses too fast, then the game feels too hard, feels rigged, feels unachievable, and the person doesn't want to play it. So a game needs to be designed with a good game flow, meaning the difficulty gets harder as about the same degree to most players' skill development gets better. And here's this individual's evaluation of why Fortnite has been so successful and for many years now. It's got good usability, avoids confusion, removes frustration, constant progression towards gold. When people die, they can respawn, play again very quickly. Cosmetic options allow for self-expression. In creative mode, pretty much they can do anything they want and it has a very strong social component, whether they want to compete against each other, cooperate, hang out, chat, dance, be creative, watch concerts together, such as celebrity concerts. Uh, it's goofy, encourages experimentation, offers surprises and mysteries, just checks all the boxes. There are certain things that can make some games more addicting than others. One is endless play, meaning even when the person isn't logged on, the game is still in play. Other players can loot their stuff or ruin what they've been working on even when they're not logged in. Appealing to FOMO, fear of missing out on things their friends experienced that they missed out on because they weren't logged in on uh, deals, time-limited offers, et cetera, peer culture, popularity, shaming, achievement. So people may get shamed because their character is wearing the outfit that every character uh, spawns with when they start the game and they don't have the, the cool purchased outfits. So they might get shamed for that. Most games have a ranking system where players can see other players' rankings. So it encourages a bit of that competitive element, like, like most games can be competitive, but that's kind of always there. They may want to play to get better than their peers or to get their character skill level high enough to defeat some boss in the game. If they spent money on it, including in gambling ways, and we'll be talking more about that one specifically, grinding, a great example of grinding is think Minecraft, right? Players have to mine and mine and mine minerals just to build their tools, just then to build the stuff that they want to build or create weapons for the monsters that come and blow up, whatever it is. Um, instant and intermittent rewards. So every time they log in, fun, cool stuff happens. Um, they achieve something, they get stuff. They uh, kill somebody's character and they get their loot, whatever it is. And a draw for just one more thinking or compulsive play. So there's this feeling of just one more round, just one more game, just one more. The blurred lines between gambling and gaming we're going to be covering today, and there is more than this, are some of these things. We're going to start with eSports, and I want to find out from the audience what you all know about eSports. What's the difference between esports and fantasy sports? And you should be seeing a poll question on your screen. Is esports just watching sports games online? Is fantasy sports competitive video gaming? Is esports competitive video gaming? Or are you thinking D? They're the same thing, right? So go ahead and put in what you think is the correct answer here. And then I'm going to give you an example. Excellent. I see a lot of responses coming in. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. And if you said the third option, esports is competitive video gaming, you are correct. That is right. And here's an example. So you can see in the top right here, here's a team. There are esports tournaments 
um, in of, of single player games, uh, but a lot of them are in teams. You see they have jerseys, they have coaches, they run plays, they train together. The arena is decked out and the floor doesn't need to be uh, kept clear for athletes. They can sell that for more tickets. And the stage built there has the red team, the blue team, and the big screens are going to show things like what the players are seeing, as well as close-ups on their faces and other things. There's an announcer in the game. I'm going to show you a little bit of this video. And to me, this feels a bit like a mix between Super Bowl highlights and a movie trailer. And this is from the International. Um, I don't remember what year, but the International is one of the largest esports tournaments in the world. And for five years, it was hosted in Seattle, Washington. So that's just a little bit of a flavor of an esports tournament. If you didn't know that esports was a big deal, it is a very big deal, okay? It is second in popularity in the U.S. to most major league sports other than the NFL, but globally, it is a big uniter. Most uh, countries have a pretty big esports industry. I let you know that the International was one of the largest esports tournaments in the world. Uh, it was previously held in Seattle, Washington. Um, I think in 2019 it was in Canada, 2020 was canceled, and 2021 was held in Bucharest, Romania, and, and was going on just recently. If you look right here, the prize pool, not the total income generated, but just the prize pool for the winners is over 40 million dollars. So yes, this is a big deal. And if you're wondering, is does this have anything to do with gambling? Well, let's just take a closer look at this website and all of the different things they have for people to click on to make bets on the international. It was considered to be added to the Olympics um, eSports. E so it didn't make it, but don't be surprised if it does eventually. A lot of young people do have aspirations to become pro gamers, and there's good reasons for that. They see people their own age online being pro gamers all the time, so it feels very, very attainable. However, what most young people get out of it is gaming problems or gaming disorder, not the pro level achievement. This is one little look into the life of a pro gamer, and I'm just going to show you the first few minutes of this. The esports is kind of like a rocket, a boom, straight up. And the money that's coming in now is insane. Six figure salary in the spotlight on stage, and some of them are just wholly unprepared. This chair is $1,600. $1,600 for yeah. this chair. I'm living a dream for a lot of people, but yeah, it, sometimes it sucks because of all these drawbacks. You guys have to rush. You guys have to rush. 
Oh my gosh. So there's this badge of honor in esports that I grind. I play hour upon hour upon hour upon hour. I put in, if I grind more, I'm going to get better. If I play for too long, I'll get pain at the end of the day. Too long meaning how many hours? Like eight hours. If he can be successful playing video games, he wanted to pursue this, I would be very supportive. That's Got him, honey. I would have more confidence. Everyone knows there's burnout in this. Depression, anxiety. There's a lot of pressure to do that kind of extra work. I love this industry, but somebody has to talk about what's wrong with it. There we go. Some of the most popular Twitch channels, this is as of April this year. Please keep in mind that a lot of what I'm showing you today is going to be outdated tomorrow. So you have to kind of make a choice to stay up to date on a lot of these things. Uh, some of the most popular Twitch channels. So Twitch can, a lot of people stream gaming on Twitch, but there's other things as well, mu musicians and whatnot, but a lot of the most popular ones are gamers streaming. There are varsity esports leagues and college scholarships for this. So there is, in some cases, the opportunity to get college paid for for their gaming skill level and achievement. So that's one motivator to keep playing. Uh, the University of Washington, Washington does have a program called The Hub, and they do a lot of activities, including bowling, and I don't remember what else, but they also have an esports league. There is fantasy sports for esports. And we're going to switch now to app games. So, this is one uh, area of controversy is the overlap between a lot of our app game features and gambling. So, the main question here is does it meet the definition of gambling by having prize chance and consideration? For example, do you pay money for the chance to win a prize? The prize might be beating the level. And if you've ever been stuck on a level for like 20 rounds and then finally beat it, you know how rewarding that can feel. Uh, a few other honorable mentions here, Coin Master, its main feature to make achievements and move through the game are via a slot machine. One of my uh, beloved apps for language learning called Duolingo also has this integration of a gambling element. It's not a main feature, but it's still snuck in there. You can wager on yourself whether you're going to log in and do your learning exercises for, say, seven days straight and then get more of their lingots to then buy more language learning features. Uh, and there's even more simplistic app styles kind of borrowing from the gambling industry a little bit. This might look like Wheel of Fortune where you just spin the wheel to figure out what you're going to eat. It's important to note that the Apple Store ranks Coin Master at 17 plus. Google Play ranks it as teen 13 plus. And some parental guideline uh, services rank it at 18 plus. I want you to keep this in mind when we look at what Grand Theft Auto is age rated at. And the convergence isn't always obvious. If you go to your Google Play Store right now, you're gonna find a lot of these games and some of the most popular as of July, 2021, Coin Master I just showed you, actually Candy Crush I also just showed, showed you, Roblox is gonna come back up in just a little bit. And you might notice some of these others have some gambling elements as well, like Bingo, here's another Candy Crush version. And we're gonna do another polling question here which is, why is this important? Why should you even care that any of these games are borrowing from the gambling industry? Does it even matter? Would you say, A, no, it doesn't matter. These are fun games. They're 100% harmless. B, my kid is going to spend all my money. And to be fair, I do not know your child. <laughs> Maybe they will spend all of your money. Maybe they won't. C, it poses risks and the game won't educate players about the risks. D, it could be triggering to people in recovery from gambling. Or E, it can make games more addicting for some. So I see a lot of responses coming in there. I'll share those momentarily. But your cue 
on the first one is a hundred percent harmless. There's very little in our world that's a hundred percent harmless, <laughs> right? Um, I don't know your kid, but C, D, and E, we're going to close that poll now. And a lot of you indicated, yes, those are ones. And some of you even said, my kid is going to spend all my money. So you know your children, right? All the more reason not to put your credit card information into their game store. The research does show that adolescents who play simulated gambling games are more likely to later move to real gambling and are more likely to have gambling problems from it. That doesn't mean that every kid exposed to this stuff is going to develop a problem, but it does mean that some of these children absolutely will, and we don't know who that will be, and nobody wants it to be their kid or their student or their young youth client. So it's absolutely on the shoulders of the professionals and parents, teachers, educators, etc., to take on the role of educating the kids and helping them to make good decisions. And I'm going to show you some ways to help them start to identify some marketing strategies that appeal to impulsive decision making, particularly by those with an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex still. Social casinos are App games, if you pull up your cell phone right now while I'm talking, go to your Play Store, type in social casino and see what comes up. That's what I'm talking about. They're going to look and sound like a gambling site. It might be something that refers to slot machines or roulette or poker or blackjack or craps or whatever. They look and feel and sound and play just like gambling games. To most reasonable people, they would assume it's a gambling game. This is, in my opinion, probably one of the reasons a lot of people have no idea that online gambling in Washington state is actually illegal because they might see these things on their cell phone, but they're not classified or regulated as gambling because while you can take money out of your bank account to buy virtual currency within the game to play the game, any money you win, including the big major jackpots that you see referenced on most of the advertisements for these games, cannot be converted into money back into your bank account. It can only be used to continue playing the game. Where the line gets even more kind of ethically blurry is some of these sites will allow people to convert those into credits that might be able to be cashed in to brick and mortar casinos for products or stuff or to play there or hotel or whatever it is. Let's talk about free to play games and how they can make all their money. So a person downloads it for free, don't have to pay anything, but these games make a fortune. So how is that? Part of that is through ads. We're all used to seeing ads absolutely everywhere these days. Microtransactions is pricing things at like 99 cents, $1.99. Seems like no big deal, but when you have hundreds of thousands of people making purchases at 99 cents, it adds up. Virtual currencies is this right here. Fortnite's version is V-Bucks, but every game has their own coins, gems, jewels, whatever. Putting items on sale, you can see here it says 50% off. Extreme discounts for first-time buyers. Battle bundles or booster packs is another one of those things that's kind of gambling because they're asking for money up front to buy this bundle, which will unlock features throughout their gameplay that would not have been unlocked to them had they not bought it up front, but they don't know at the time of purchase, what they're gonna end up getting out of it exactly. Loot boxes, we'll talk more about, time limited offers, things that expire. Anchoring is this right here. You see it every, uh, every clearance rack, every Black Friday. It's where they mark through the price, but you can still see what the price is underneath. And that's how they tell you this is a good deal because look at what it used to be, even though it's the seller making both of those numbers there. Gutchas are, kind of slot machines where you put your money in and you get some sort of gaming collectible item. You hope to get the whole collection, uh, but you might not. You just have to keep putting money in. And often it's kind of like the little monopoly things you collect from Safeway. They don't put out into circulation enough for people to win the collection. In the U.S., we do have something similar like with Magic the Gathering of Ages cards where you have to buy the deck up front and you hope that it contains the good stuff that you want, but you won't know until you buy and open it. 
Wealthy in-game economies, uh, such as creating enough stuff for people to buy, they basically have endless spend. Impulse purchases, vanity items, uh, Ninja was on our list of most popular streamers, and now you can beat him in Fortnite. Power enhancements, consumables, multiple payment methods, player retention strategies, add-ons, paywalls, meaning it's free for a limited time, subscriptions, etc. If some of these sound like gambling, it's because they're kind of borrowed from the gambling industry. We're going to talk about loot boxes as one of those examples. They have been linked to both problem gambling and problem video gaming. If you don't know what they look like, here's one classic example. This is from Overwatch. You can buy them in different quantities. It takes a few seconds to open. It has spinning lights and colors and sound effects, kind of like how a slot machine has all these different graphic elements to kind of generate anticipation of what am I going to get. And I don't know what the age of this cute little kid is here, but I really doubt that he has any concept of the value of a dollar, let alone $59.95 or how many hours his mom and or dad had to work to make $59.95 so that he could open 50 loot boxes in a couple minutes and there goes 60 bucks. They are loved or hated, okay? Some people love them. There's entire YouTube channels devoted to people opening loot boxes. This person goes through 100, 120 of them in 30 minutes often purchased by their fans and other people think they are the curse of games in today's day and age. Uh, those who enjoy unlocking stuff through reasonable grinds kind of feel like loot boxes and microtransactions came and destroyed that for them. Here's one great research study that shows all of these studies about loot boxes and do they have a positive correlation to problem gambling or problem video gaming and that's all the green there. And what they discovered was that 5% of the loot box purchasers were actually generating half of the industry revenue and that a third of that top 5% were actually people who would fall into a classification of having problem gambling. So does addiction get expensive? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. And this shows this is just one way that can express itself. And here's the big impact quote from this study I want you guys to walk away with. There is no evidence that higher loot box spend is correlated with higher earnings. Our research therefore demonstrates that games developers unwittingly or not appear to be generating outsized loot box profits from at-risk individuals. These are likely to include both people with gambling problems or problematic patterns of video gaming, but not from wealthy gamers. Now, let's take a look at this guy. This video, it's only 20 minutes. I really highly encourage you to go watch the whole thing because it is filled with a wealth of eye-openers. You can see just in this little screenshot, Candy Crush deserves an honorable mention from him too. Uh, he's a game developer talking to a room full of game developers on tips and tricks on how to get more money from their gamers on free to play games. His opening joke is a CEO and an oil chic are battling it out in your game. Who wins? The game developers win. Why is that? He says, because you're going to tell each of them, I'll give you an upside if you pay me money. And his whole talk starts on the concept that the people who are paying the most money in their games are wealthy individuals with money to burn. However, we know that the research actually shows the exact opposite. Those who are spending the most money in games are not wealthy people with money to burn. They are average people, most likely dealing with some level of gambling or video game addiction, problem gambling or problematic patterns of video gaming. That is what is, is driving their spend, not the fact that they have money to burn. That's where the ethical issue is for me. I know that you can't really read this up here, but his slide here says hook, habit, or hobby. And he's saying, here's how you monetize to people during their different stages of play. The hook is when they first start playing the game, you give them some great deal, they'd be stupid to pass up, which breaks the ice of their barrier of spending money within a game. 
Now they're more comfortable to spend money in your game. Then you sell them progress. You make sure they move through the game very quickly up front. So they think that they're really good at it. And then you sell them consumables because now the game has become their hobby and you sell them time limited offers and things that expire. So they have to keep making purchases to continue to move through the game. And I think he needs rehab at the end here, but I don't think he'd think my head is as funny as his. So virtual currencies come in all shape, forms, or sizes. And you may see things like mystery discounts or pick it up before times runs out or any kinds of those messages. And this is a great thing to educate young people about on how to view these as well as other marketing things. If you've ever seen on your phone, uh, there might be a big button that takes up like half the screen. It might be in green or blue or something that says, you know, go on to the next thing. It's making it very clear. They're trying to get you to click on that to, to buy something or purchase something or go somewhere else on their site. And there might be a little like, no thanks thing. that's just text or it might say something like, I don't want great deals, you know, and that's, so you can educate young people on those kinds of marketing strategies to be aware of that are really targeted towards impulsive decision-making and uh, clickbait. So payment methods can come in all shapes and sizes, uh, be from direct transactions, PayPal, ver uh, cryptocurrency, gift cards, whatever. If you've ever had an issue with going to the grocery store and coming home with a bunch of stuff that wasn't on your list you didn't really need, do not expect your child to have more self-control than you do. Okay, so don't put your credit card information in their game account and be mindful of where it is stored. They could pull it from like your Google profile or Amazon account. And all they really need to do is go pull the card out of your purse or wallet, take a photo of both sides and they've got free reign. So you want to not expect young people to have the impulse control of an adult who most of us struggle with that too. Gift cards might be a great way to regulate um, their how much they can spend within a game. Once the gift card's empty, they're done until whenever. Um, or maybe that's not a good idea for you and your kids. You'll have to uh, use your own judgment there. In-game gambling. So this video, they're playing slot machines inside Borderlands 3. And one is just said to the other, I'm having more fun playing the slot machine than the rest of the game. Their characters keep dying in front of these slot machines. They respawn and just come back and keep playing them. Uh, and here's just another example of in-game gambling where it, it might be a poker game inside. I think this is Red Dead Redemption 2. There's also third party skins gambling where an external site links to say their steam account and they can then take the skins they purchased inside a game or their value out to this external site and gamble them there in hopes of getting something they think is better value one example of that might be cs go lotto the owners of this one kind of had a big scandal flare up because these um, teenagers who were gamers created the site, recorded themselves playing it, they won, they posted those to their YouTube channel with titles like how to make $3,000 in five minutes, and then it was discovered they actually owned the site. So everybody kind of called them on that and said the game was rigged. And you can see down here how it works. So a purchase, a uh, person might be hoping for this gold legacy item there, and it has a near miss feature programmed in. It's depicting here. Am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? Uh, no, just missed it. So kind of like a slot machine has the jackpot icons that'll come up and visible on the screen, even though um, they just missed it. So because they're seeing it on there, it feels like, oh, I was so close. One more time and I'll get it. Same kind of feature. Um, here. If you didn't know what skins are, because I've mentioned it a number of times now, it can be different weapons or different skins or colors to put on the weapon, clothing or characters or uh, something their character does, says, dances, expressions, whatever it may be. They generally don't help a person win the game, 
Uh, it might be a different choice of, of weapon style, but not necessarily something that's going to win the game for them. And gamers tend to not like the concept of feeling like people can buy their way through a game because that feels unfair and rigged in favor of people who have or are willing to spend the money for that. This is one video you can watch on your own later if you'd like. A young man who develops a full-blown gambling disorder strictly from the gambling he was exposed to in his video game. And it gives a great example of third party skins betting that I was just talking about. And it, it talks about that CSGO lotto scandal that happened. We have a podcast. I highly encourage you to check out our podcast. It is called the Connections Healthy Gambling and Gaming Podcast. You can find it on our website if you click this link when you download the slides, or you can go to pretty much anywhere you normally like to get your podcasts and search the title of it and it should come up for you. You may be particularly interested in this episode called Recovering from a Video Game Addiction. Our guest on this episode shares his journey of becoming addicted to video games and gambling via the video games. And he does an amazing job of describing uh, loot boxes and other gambling features and why certain games can be addicting and everything from a gamer's perspective. And at the time we recorded this, I, I forget when that was, he was like three years gaming free. And he talks about what he does with his life now, how he keeps in balance with his screen use and his cell phone use, and how much he's enjoying all the time that he has now that he's not gaming so much. He's a really fantastic. Children who gamble, uh, those who bet skins had higher rates of at-risk problem gambling than those who did not, meaning they're more at risk of having some level of problems could develop into a diagnosable gaming or gambling disorder. Again, we don't know who it will be, but we know it will happen to some. So we've got to do our best to give all young people the best chance possible of not experiencing problems from this. Another thing you should be aware of is gamers using their sites to stream gambling. It isn't necessarily well received by some of their fans, as evidenced by some of these comments, uh, not happy that he's gambling in front of his fan base, which includes kids. Um, and this person says it's the best anti-gambling commercial ever. And I'm going to come back to why streamers would do this here. So in this little clip, you can watch the whole thing, but I'm going to give you a word of caution here. This video is a man giving his own basically opinion. And he starts off saying, I've done 24 hours of research on this. And that by no means makes him an expert. Okay. But just to have a good example for you, the clip I'm about to show you, and I need to close my door. The clip I'm about to show you is gamers talking about how much they have been paid in cryptocurrency to use their gaming sites to stream gambling. So let's watch a bit of that. Well, and it doesn't want to play it for me. There. These companies were coming to me. They're like, hey, we want you to stream on our website, gamble, and we are willing to pay you $35,000 an hour. That was double any sponsorship I ever got in my entire life. But listen, it's what they wanted. So if they're paying $35,000, yes, $35,000 an hour. And this is a uh, this is a pretty normal thing for a lot of these uh, these platforms. Why do you think so many people are taking these deals? Yeah, why, why do you think they're doing it? It's because they're being paid ridiculous amounts of money. One name company offered him $35,000 an hour to stream while gambling on their website. How much do they pay you as a flat fee every month for fulfilling your contractual I'll obligations. I'll probably get in trouble for releasing it, but I'll tell you a million. 
a million a month. So 35,000 an hour for a million a month uh, kind of explains why streamers might use their site for this, even if maybe they have reservations about it. Here's an, another video I'm referencing here, but I'll give you a, a I'll encourage you to use a grain of salt if you do watch the whole thing. This is a man who has put together a video saying to parents, here's my professional suggestion of what you should encourage your kids to invest in. It's an investment portfolio for youth. And it's investing in a lot of cryptocurrency and gaming sites. I'm not showing you this because I'm recommending any of that, but I am going to show you that some of these things are games. I mentioned that Roboblox would come back up. It's one of his honorable mentions. Roboblox is a game where people basically use it to create their own games within it that other people can then play. Another example he mentions is um, Axie. They create these little uh, characters. It's a blockchain game. They create, collect, and trade these characters and players earn cryptocurrency for playing the game. They can also sponsor someone else who maybe can't afford to build their characters. They can sponsor them. And then when that person is playing the game, they get some of that cryptocurrency as well. So interesting how all of this kind of comes together. And the overlap with substance use disorder, gaming disorder has been recognized by both the American Psychiatric Association, it's in the back of the DSM-5 for areas needing more research, and the World Health Organization says we're good on research, it is a disease, it is a gaming disorder, and their guidelines are on that are pretty similar. If you look at internet gaming disorder proposed criteria versus the current gambling disorder criteria and substance use disorder criteria. I encourage you to pull out a DSM-5 if you've got one handy, read all of these, and it starts to feel like the same thing over and over again. Substance use disorder criteria are in four categories, and the other two overlap with those same categories of physical dependence, impaired control, risky use, meaning they're doing it even though there's problems being caused, buy it and I still can't stop doing it anyway. And it's causing social problems. So they all have these kind of key characteristics are very much the same. And the impact on a person's life also pretty much the same. Loss of control, brain changes, mood changes, interferes with relationships, it gets expensive, can cause physical health issues, mental health issues, sleep issues, etc. Interferes with work, school, opportunities, productivity, performance, reprioritizes relationships and activities and thoughts of suicide. If I were to hide this title and tell you this was a list of uh, life impacts from cannabis use disorder, alcohol use disorder, heroin use disorder, might those things cause loss of control, brain changes, mood changes, interferes with relationships, etc. Same thing. So it looks very much like substance use disorder when you're looking at the impact on a person's life. Essentially, when addiction takes over, it takes over, it can take everything very, very quickly. Other things to be aware of that co-occur with gaming a lot, internet addiction, social media, screen use, pornography, they just overlap quite a bit. So I encourage you to get more training, diving deeper into those areas where you can find it. The help available for, for these things is just like with substance use, essentially, there's 12-step and community support, there's outpatient treatment, which could be either like in a private practice setting, one-on-one, -on -one, or in groups, or all of that, and residential treatment. Restart Life is one of the first outpatient and residential treatment facilities in the country to treat gaming, and it's in Washington. They treat both youth and adults, so same kind of services available for this, though the uh, insurance coverage is not the same, and there's no federal funding for this. All right, let's talk about some healthy play and support here. Let me go here. All right, so loot boxes. While we might consider them gambling, 
the gaming industry does not. They now have on their rating system, they classify loot boxes and other kind of mystery gambling related things like this. In-game purchases includes random items. If you see, see this, that means loot boxes, mystery discounts, some sort of surprise mechanic where they're buying money, they're paying for something up front without actually knowing what they're going to get out of it. Can also be other, other descriptors will go in this little section there. However, if a game does contain gambling, real gambling, meaning they pay real money for it, it has to get an age rating of 18 plus, or simulated gambling, meaning they don't have to pay real money for it, though these two could look virtually identical. They get this as a content descriptor, which also includes some other uh, types of content the game might have, leading to a GTA 5 example here. So its content descriptor list is rather lengthy, <laughs> okay? This is a uh, pretty graphic kind of game where people are playing the role of a criminal who does all kinds of activities. But notice that one of the marketing ads for GTA 5 features this Diamond Casino Resort, which is one element in the game, but Real gambling and simulated gambling doesn't even make the content descriptor list. And what age rating have they given it? 17 plus. I don't know anybody of any age that I think should probably be exposing themselves to this kind of content, right? So I don't, I wouldn't agree that it's appropriate for 17 plus. Now compare this back to Coin Master with a little slot machine element, also rated 17 plus. So all this, just to bring your awareness to how these things are rated, don't rely on that to make the decisions for you or the young people you work with or have in your home on what they choose to play. We have, if you want more training, we have a Foundations in Gaming Disorder program, covers treatment and prevention strategies. We just finished the last iteration uh, earlier this month. We do hope to have it again in 2022. If you would like to be informed of uh, our next training opportunities, you can just let us know. I'm gonna let Dr. Hillary Cash explain the risk factors that might put a young person at risk of developing a gaming disorder in this clip here. And this was from our February launch. So ignore My it. name is Hillary Cash and I'm the co-founder of Restart. And Restart Life uh, began in 2009. So we've been around quite a while and we started because there was no specially designed intensive residential program uh, that was designed to meet the needs of internet and video game addicts specifically. There are a number of things that put people at risk for developing uh, a gaming disorder. The first I would say is too early introduction of screens to children. And the age of introducing screens to children is actually getting lower and lower and lower. So we are now seeing parents who have are putting devices, tablets and phones into the hands of, of infants and toddlers even. And that gets um, that really places those children at very high risk for the, that screen exposure to interfere with good, healthy child development in those early years. And those early years are absolutely the critical years, laying the foundation for healthy development uh, for the rest of life. So that's just one item to be aware of is child development and how it can be impacted by screen use. And some of you might have seen ads for like these devices that make it so you can attach your phone to the baby carrier, the baby changing station. Uh, not necessarily a good idea. <laughs> so just in general, the risk factors and protective factors for developing uh, a gaming related disorder look very much like that for substance use risk factors with a few differences, 
early big wins and things inherent in the game that might uh, make a person think, oh, I'm good at this, or I could do this pro, et cetera. But in general, dysfunction at home, family history of mental health or addiction issues, uh, lack of a good friend, peer group, or the wrong peer group, coping skills, all of the normal kind of risk and protective factors you'd see for substance use, pretty much the same for gaming and gambling as well. Trauma history, of course, is a big one as well. I'm gonna skip through here and just let you know that if you print these slides, you have a gaming disorder as well as a gambling disorder screening tool right at the end for you. You can just print it out front and back, has screening questions, resource list right on it, scoring guide on the back. So I want to make sure you have that. Some things that you can do right away are set your own limits, your own self-awareness, be compassionate and non-judgmental to anybody having problems with this. It's kind of designed to be addicting. They don't need to be uh, judged and criticized for it. They need help and to be able to set limits or to seek help and be a role model right? If you're having a conversation with the young person about how much they're gaming and you can't go that conversation without looking at your phone at least once or your email, they pick up on that, right? So you really want to be a role model and be able to talk to them about how you keep yourself in check with your screen use. And here's a few guidelines on helping young people to be able to make their own decisions around their game play being asking themselves how are players encouraged to spend more time in this game what are the prompts the game gives them to keep playing to come back uh, to do one more round whatever it is how are players encouraged to spend money in this game what is it prompting them to buy are there pop-ups coming in uh advertising sales and deals or what other people are buying, anything like that, what can they find that that game's doing? And lastly, who's really in control of their gameplay? Do they set their own limits and stick to them? Meaning before they start a game, they should make a decision as to how long they intend to play that game, an hour, two hours, whatever. And then at the end of that time, do they have an impulse to play more? Now, where's that impulse coming from? Did the game just do something that prompted them to want to play more? Did one of their friends online just say something to prompt them to want to play more? In other words, are they in control of their gameplay and how long they play, or is the game or their friends? And lastly, we're going to end with a final poll question here. What can you do? Can you have some screening tools and resource lists handy? I just gave you a bunch in this slide deck. If you download it, print it out, save it, whatever, you've got resources. How you need to use those depends on your, your setting, but you have them. Can you be monitor my own screen use and be able to talk to youth about what I do to keep myself in check? C, talk to youth about what they like about gaming and what else they, they do or can do to fill those same needs. Help youth to learn how to recognize clickbait and marketing strategies that appeal to impulsive decision-making and peer approval. And can you E, I can set parental controls on the Play Store of my kid's phone and install monitoring apps to help us because you're in on this too, and you're, you're keeping yourself in check and being a role model to help us be aware of how much and how we use our phones, right? So thank you. I see a lot of responses there. And of course, depending on what you do, where you work and your role, you may be able to do a lot more things, but it's nice to see that many of you said, yeah, you can do all kinds of these and you may come up with a lot more. So thank you for that. And I just want to encourage you to check out all of the great resources that you have in these slides, uh, different things you can use like this just to have a conversation with young people on how to make decisions around healthy behaviors. There's um, 
we have uh, live streaming. You can watch these on demand on our YouTube channel afterward. There's different program examples of prevention efforts in this field you can check out. The helpline is on their resource list, monitoring apps and where to find parental controls and guidelines and a bunch of references. If you want to dig into research because you want to know more what the research has shown on this, there's a whole host of references for you as well that you can choose from. So thank you very, very much to all of you. I hope this was helpful. I hope that you will continue to dig and get more training and talk to young people about this and let us know if there's anything else we can do.